So my name is Lisa Wallace, and I'm the editor in chief of the Stanford Review, which is an on campus bi weekly publication focusing on um, investigative journalism with a conservative and libertarian opinion section. Um, and historically, the, the Stanford Review has had Hoover lunches with the, with the Hoover Institution, where we invite a Hoover fellow to come talk to us over a pizza lunch and invite students from the community that might be interested in, in that Hoover fellow. So today we have Larry Diamond, um, who's speaking, and Larry's pretty accomplished guy, so I'm going to read from, from my bio from a paper. So, Larry Diamond is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, where he also directs for the Center for Democracy Development and the Rule of Law. He's the founding co-editor of the Journal of Democracy and also serves as a senior consultant at the International Forum for Democratic Studies of the National Endowment for Democracy. He's advised and lectured to the World Bank, the United Nations, the State Department, and other governmental and non-governmental agencies dealing with governance and development. Um, at Stanford University, Larry Diamond is a, a professor by courtesy of political science and sociology. Diamond has received both Teacher of the Year by the ASSU and the Dinkelspiel Award for his outstanding contribution to undergraduate education. Diamond has also edited and co-edited 36 books on democracy. Um, I also want to mention briefly that Larry Diamond is currently the executive producer of a new documentary called A Whisper to a Roar on democracy activists in five countries, Egypt, Malaysia, Ukraine, Venezuela, and Zimbabwe. The film is currently screening at universities and other organizations in the lead up to its DVD digital release in April. Um, so be sure to check out the Hoover Institution Facebook page for pre-screenings and events surrounding that uh, documentary. So without further ado, please allow me to welcome um, Professor Larry Diamond, who will be speaking about democracy today. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. And after that very warm introduction, I'd say, don't bother coming to class anymore. I'll just give you an A, and that'll be the end of that. I don't think actually you need this mic. I think you got this one. So okay. sorry about that. Um, so I thought, I mean, President Obama has just been inaugurated for a second term. Uh, I thought the thing I could most, most usefully do is merge my interest in the state of democracy in the world with my <laughs> very strong interest as well in American foreign policy and try and have these two concerns interact and um, think about the world that uh, I won't say Barack Obama f uh, inherits because now four years later it's a world that he's partly uh, influenced and shaped, but certainly the world he faces as he begins his second term. And I'll just, uh, you know, open this with a reflection that I thought was very interesting. Did anyone here watch Meet the Press on Sunday? Uh, you, can, you can do it on uh, YouTube probably. But um, most of the discussion of course, because most of his inaugural address, and it could have been anticipated and was successfully that this would be the case, was about domestic policy. There was maybe a couple sentences in his inaugural address about foreign policy. Fortunately, one of them was about the need to defend freedom and democracy in the world, though I think we need to have a searching assessment of the extent to which he's actually done that rather than simply made uh, eloquent and lofty speeches about it. Uh, and that's, of course, parenthetically stands in sharp contrast to President Bush's second inaugural address. And if you just want an interesting analytic exercise in the history of the American presidency, I'd say compare the second addre uh, inaugural address of George W. Bush in January of 2005, which was all virtually the entire speech about the need to spread freedom and democracy around the world and um, about it being a, a moral and really, if you read the language, almost religious imperative. Uh, and Barack Obama's second inaugural address, which was almost entirely about domestic policy and challenges uh, and imperatives, including moral imperatives. So uh, there is uh, a long-running, and I'd say for a democracy as important to the world as the United States, unavoidable tension between two major streams in American <coughs> foreign policy. Uh, one is idealism, the other is realism. I think you're well familiar with this. On the one hand, the argument goes, 
and suffuses George W. Bush's second inaugural address more than any major speech of any, Amer uh, any major American president that I can think of. I mean, uh, I will say I did not vote for George W. Bush in 2004, but, you know, I was thrilled by the speech. I thought I could have written that. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, there's a tension between that and the idea that we live in a dangerous world. We have very uh, hard interests. Uh, we are threatened. And of course, um, no one knew that better than George W. Bush. Um, being inside <clears throat> and at the leadership of the United States government on September 11th of 2001. Uh, and we can't afford to always elevate our ideals, our principles, our commitment to human rights and freedom over the need to secure our interests, say, during the Cold War in a epic uh, and um, uh, existential struggle against totalitarianism. Uh, and now in uh, what many uh, see to be a, sem a similarly epical, epical uh, and in a way existential struggle against um, uh, twisted radical uh, notions of uh, what Islam or uh, you know, religious faith mean and their merger with uh, access to, uh, unfortunately, um, potentially weapons of mass destruction. So um, these two streams of belief, orientation, framing of our purpose and uh, place in the world, idealism and realism have coexisted since the founding of the American Republic in ways that I explore in another class than the one I'm teaching this quarter and that we could debate if you want to reflect on the uh, history later. Now, I don't have time to explain all the reasons why, um, but I do think that having a freer and more democratic world uh, is profoundly in the American interest. Um, if you look at where terrorist threats emanate from, they're not from stable democracies, certainly not liberal democracies. I mean, we may have running battles with France over issues. Uh, uh, we may be in uh, trade friction with Europe or other democracies. But you look at where the threats are to US national security, whether from failed states like Yemen uh, and Somalia, or fa I should call Yemen a failing state. It hasn't failed yet, and there's a real chance it can turn around but a fail, completely failed state like Somalia or Afghanistan when the Taliban seize control of it. Um, and the threats that emanate to peace and security uh, from uh, other authoritarian states uh, where we think, okay, we can live with them because we don't like them, but they're stable. Well, look how stable Syria is now. And, um, uh, you know, we thought, oh, we could do a deal with uh, Gaddafi. It wasn't such a problem. Uh, and then rea we realized that, you know, he'd been the rot that was underneath in terms of <coughs> this uh, perverse and destructive accumulation of uh, mercenaries uh, for hire uh, and the accumulation of vast weapon stores just so he could suppress his population that has, with his fall, radiated out uh, throughout the Maghreb. I will tell you, I was a very strong advocate of military intervention in Libya. Uh, Obama waited to the last possible moment. Uh, the opposition in Benghazi was at risk of falling if he didn't act in 48 hours. And um, I would have done it sooner, but I'm glad he did it. Uh, and uh, I do not think that because one consequence of that has been the radiating out of these weapons uh, and these thugs from Libya out into the rest of the region, that we can say this was the wrong thing to have done. Um, ask the people of Libya whether they think it was the wrong thing to have done. And ask the question, uh, how, much, uh, how many lives were lost in Libya in this effort to help the people free themselves 
versus how many lives were lost in Iraq, about which I have complicated feelings because I did go there to work on the transition, but I, I think the intervention was a mistake. Uh, by the same token, um, you know, I wasn't sure I'd ever be uttering these words about um, uh, our global reality, but I thank God for the French. And I certainly didn't expect to be saying this about a socialist president of France. If Francois Hollande had not acted uh, to insert French military force into Mali when he did, it was a situation remarkably similar to Libya. Mali was at risk of falling within 48 hours. They were 300 miles away from Bamako with an, a Malian military that had essentially disintegrated. Now, you can say, oh no, we've stirred up a hornet's nest. Uh, now look what we have to deal with. Um, I think that if we draw the lesson from Afghanistan that we should just look the other way and close our eyes when uh, a band or a small army of intolerant, uh, hateful terrorist thugs take control of a country and say, we can wall that off and we can live with that. Uh, I think that is um, a profoundly naive and dangerous view. We live in a globalized world. Um, these people have a global view of their ambitions. Um, uh, and if you think that they'll be satisfied with control of Mali, control of the Maghreb, and it will end there, take a look at the map and see how close Europe is. Uh, and take a look at what happened on September 11th and see how close we are uh, in a globalized world. So here we see, particularly I think in Mali, that, the, that there is an intimate and interesting interaction between uh, our ideal interests in democracy and our um, hard interests in securing our uh, safety and our own freedom. It's a very complex story in Mali. I'm frankly still trying to figure it out uh, because I wasn't paying terribly close attention to what was happening underneath the hood of Malian democracy. Um, certainly the president who had been in power uh, for the previous nearly eight years, he was close to leaving power early last year when the military coup occurred in Mali, was not as good, not as honest, uh, as his predefe predecessor, the founding president, Alpha Conare, who went on to become the Secretary <coughs> General of the African Union. And there was a lot of corruption, but you know, there was what you get in a lot of weak states, particularly in Africa, because Africa is a continent, unfortunately, disproportionately populated by weak estates. Uh, and that is um, dissatisfied soldiers, um, who have not imbibed the norms of civilian control over the military uh, and see opportunities to accumulate wealth and power or defend or aggrandize their own interests and maybe take advantage of pockets of dissatisfaction and popular discontent with the government of the day, you know, can just seize power with uh, fairly l uh, little uh, consequence or restraint. This happened a long time ago uh, in the Gambia uh, uh, by, you know, I'm not even sure he was above the rank of uh, major then. Uh, and for the last 20 plus years, the Gambia has become an increasingly tragic, decrepit, uh, narco-trafficking state um, ruled by a uh, uh, paranoid thug, um, who doesn't really hesitate to just eliminate someone if they get in their way. This is in a country of a million people. You look at the map, it's a finger sticking into Senegal. Uh, it's totally vulnerable and surrounded. The fact that the West let this happen, um, I think is, again, just, but it's Gambia. How many people have even heard of the place, not to mention been there? 
uh, there's, there seemed to be no strategic interest there until he started opening up his country uh, to uh, the narco trafficking trade so that he could get w rich because much of West Africa is now becoming, you know, basically a transshipment point. Uh, for cocaine and other uh, dangerous drugs on their way to the lucrative European market. But um, I would argue that we just can't be so apathetic um, or so casual in our reaction to what happens in seemingly marginal and unimportant places. I'm not sure in the world we live in now where terrorists and international drug lords and other uh, international criminals are looking for havens, looking for territory, looking for places from which they can operate uh, and uh, places they can at least capture some de facto political control over. I'm not really sure there are unimportant places in the world. Now we can't deploy military f force everywhere, but you know, uh, we could have done much more to bring this uh, thuggish new government to its knees, to apply international sanctions, uh, to rob it of economic support. Uh, a good number of African states um, still derive 50 percent or more of their recurrent budgets from foreign aid. That's a whole other story, by the way, that I don't have time to get into, but I'll be glad to later. And we should not keep subsidizing these people who are preying on their governments, uh, preying on their people, uh, sucking the international community dry, <laughs> accumulating wealth with which to buy houses in Paris and London and in the United States, you know, spending the money to go to Disneyland and you know, uh, enjoy the theater in London or whatever it is. Um, they shouldn't be allowed to set foot in Europe or the United States. Uh, and we should be going after them with all the power of financial penalty that we're visiting on um, major terrorist leaders, including Iran, which I will come to in a minute. Now, um, let me uh, conclude with uh, a few other points about the world I think uh, Barack Obama is going to confront and why the reason I mentioned uh, Meet the Press is because you know, everybody went on and on about this domestic challenge and conflict and that. And Richard Engel, who is the chief foreign correspondent for NBC, said, you know, hey, wait a minute, you know, you're missing something big here. There's the rest of the world. Foreign policy is going to intervene. Uh, global crises are going to intervene. Uh, and if President Obama thinks, and I, I don't really think he does think, but he may not realize the extent to which this is possibly going to be true, that you know, he can just hand the portfolio over to John Kerry while he focuses on um, his domestic agenda, such as it is, um, I think that um, reality is going to intrude in a way that I think we can anticipate and certainly, history tells us in ways that we just can't anticipate. So one thing we can anticipate, OK, this has been kicked down the road and kicked down the road. Um, Israel kicked it down the road into this calendar year in a way I didn't expect them to. I thought Netanyahu was going to bomb Iran last year. But I think that um, uh, the Obama administration persuaded the Israeli government that there was more time in terms of the, with their intelligence uh, to stop Iran from actually going nuclear, and I mean going nuclear in a military sense, not in terms of developing isotopes for medical, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, medical treatment, or even truly peaceful and verifiable civilian use of, of nuclear energy. Uh, and obviously, I think it should be obvious to everybody in this room that the devastating computer virus that substantially set back uh, Iran's um, uh, uh, nuclear um, activities, its uh, nuclear enrichment activities, um, did not just come randomly from some unknown place. Let's put it that way, and you can connect the dots. 
Um, but so we've run out of those, those options. Uh, now all we have left is sanctions. Sanctions or bombing. Uh, and I think that sanctions are having a devastating effect on the Iranian regime. Uh, and I strongly support them and would favor tightening them further despite the terrible pain that I regret it is causing to the Iranian people, because all we have left is sanctions or war. Um, and um, the sanctions have a possible second order effect uh, beyond just hopefully inducing the regime to finally make profound negotiating concessions that would pull back from the development of a nuclear weapon, which is, I'd say, very obviously and probably intractably their goal. And that is they are um, progressively undermining the legitimacy of the regime more and more, narrowing the base of the regime, and weakening it in a way that I, make, I think may make it more and more vulnerable to collapse at some point when there's a political crisis like the one after the 2009 national election that almost brought down the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, my colleague Abbas Malani, um, who studies Iran and many of you know, a uh, fellow here at Hoover, believes that the regime was really very near to collapse and that the supreme leader actually had a plane waiting to take him out of the country. That's how close they came. Um, I am against military action in Iran, period. Uh, I will be glad to have this debate with anyone. I think that uh, anyone who thinks that military action uh, is, can be limited and effective is, again, very naive. It's going to kill thousands of Iranian civilians. It's probably going to destroy precious cultural sites. Um, it is going to lock the Iranian regime into place for probably another generation as it rallies the society against the United States and the West, unifies much of the base in, the, in a way that sanctions are dividing it. Uh, and I don't want to throw them that lifeline. Uh, now, I know what's the risk and cost, and it's a terrible choice. It is, in my opinion, the single most difficult international choice that Barack Obama will have to make, and he's most likely going to have to make it in the next 12 months, unless, you know, Maybe if he follows Tom Friedman's advice in the New York Times today and puts a very far-reaching uh, deal on the table, which is you can have civilian nuclear power, but there's going to be highly intrusive monitoring, and that's it. I don't env envision the, the regime <coughs> taking that deal, even if it's offered. Uh, and I don't think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, who it's clear has just been reelected for another term, though in a different type of political coalition probably emerging, is going to wait much longer either. It's, it's going to come to a head sometime this year, and it's an agonizing choice. And I respect uh, strongly people with different views. I, I think it's a Hobbesian problem. Let me conclude with the Arab Spring, and then I will answer any questions you have. Um, I think we are at an interesting and still very, very early moment in the struggle for democracy and human dignity in the Arab world. Four Arab autocrats have fallen in the last two years as a result of popular mobilization. In only one of those countries has the result been the emergence of even a tentative electoral democracy. and. Um, there, it's by no means out of the woods. It's tentative, it's challenged, it's wrestling with a lot of problems, including, of course, the familiar divisions about the role of religion and so on, but also deep economic problems. Uh, Egypt, I am deeply worried about. Um, I had an uh, open question in my mind. Really, I'm not an ex expert on the Arab world. I follow it. <coughs> but when the majority, and I think it was a majority, of people following Egypt and people following um, Arab politics among the American and, and sort of international political science community were saying Muslim Brotherhood has evolved. 
It's a different Muslim Brotherhood now. It's more pragmatic. Um, they're willing, they've renounced violence. Well, they did that a long time ago. Um, they are, you know, playing by the rules of the democratic game. I mean, my attitude, well, is I'm skeptical. Um, you know, I subscribe to the service MEMRI, M-E-M-R-I, Middle East, you know the acronym, Bill? I give it Research Institute, Middle East Media Research Institute or something like that. M-E-M-R-I, highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in the region because they do something that's otherwise kind of hard to get, which is English translations of what a lot of these actors are saying in Arabic. So it's both the most horrible and dangerous and also the most interesting yes. and popular. Yes, and, and liberal. So they were among the first to break, you know, what Mohammed Morsi really had to say in Arabic about Jews and about Israel and about the fact that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt was talking out of both sides of its mouth, was giving encouraging and relatively tolerant and liberal uh, signals to the West in English while they were saying vile, racist, um, uh, and uh, bigoted and intolerant things to their people in Arabic. And fortunately, the American embassy did post a comment, I think on Twitter, uh, to the Muslim Brotherhood that said, hey, you know what? Uh, we actually have Arabic speakers here in this building, and we're watching what you're saying and, and writing in Arabic as well. I have come to the conclusion uh, that the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is not in Nakhda in Tunisia, and they may have their own hegemonic tendencies, but they're, uh, they're embedded in a much more pluralistic reality and with a leader, Rashid Ganoushi, who I think has evolved much further than any of the Muslim Brotherhood leaders. I don't doubt that liberal Islamists have emerged in Egypt. I think one of them ran for president and actually did not finish that far behind Morsi in the first round. This is the tragedy of Egypt in the last 18 months. You look at the first round of the presidential election vote and if three or four liberal and moderate Islamist candidates had managed to forge uh, a common front, they would have trounced both Shafiq and Morsi, the regime, old regime candidate and the Muslim Brotherhood candidate. They would have made it into the runoff against one of the two of them, and they would have trounced that other person in the runoff election. Now ask yourself, the military obviously wanted Shafiq, the old regime candidate, to be the president of Egypt. Uh, it was a very close runoff um, uh, and not a very transparent electoral system. I don't think it's all at all obvious that they didn't manipulate that to make sure that Shafiq was in the runoff with the Muslim Brotherhood, thinking that Shafiq could win. In any case, you can manipulate a close election uh, easier without leaving fingerprints than a lopsided one. The point is Egypt got close to a very different outcome. And if there's another free and fair election, I think the Muslim Brotherhood will lose a lot of ground. What has been haunting advocates of democratic change in the Arab region that I think now hangs like a dark cloud over the future of Egypt is the famous phrase of Bush 41's Assistant Secretary of State, I think for the Near East, Edward Jeregian, who's now head of the Bush Center in Texas, that the danger, if there's a breakthrough to political pluralism in the Arab world, is free and fair elections. One person, one vote, once. And after that, a hegemonic party comes to power and barricades itself in power. This has been happening in slow motion for 10 years in Turkey, and no one's been paying attention. Um, Erdogan now is on the cusp of engineering a profound and, I think, extremely dangerous constitutional reform that will change Turkey um, from a parliamentary system to a presidential system, and a highly concentrated one. He'll then run for president, and, you know, you'll have a situation where Erdogan might be in power for 20 years or more. 
so Turkey is sliding in a very dangerous direction. Egypt is already gone over the cliff in terms of democratic possibilities. And I'd like to know, I could go on about Bahrain, which I've written about. I'd like to know where Barack Obama is on this. Um, he fell for Morsi's uh, cynical game. Uh, you know, the Hamas-Israel uh, conflict blew up. Morsi made him tempor temporar himself temporarily useful in going to Gaza and helping to broker a very temporary ceasefire. And suddenly we're enamored of Morsi as a progressive and, you know, someone like Mubarak just from a different angle who might not be a Democrat can be can useful to us. Well, read the ideology uh, of this un not so reformed Muslim Brotherhood because most of the reformers left to form another party and make a judgment about how durably reliable they will be. Uh, they have a strategy. It may not be an Islamic state in Egypt. I really don't think it is. I think it'll be Sharia rule, you know, some influence of the Quran. But it's what it is in Turkey. It's just political hegemony. It's not democracy. And if we aren't more actively engaged in exposing this and resisting this, the struggle for democracy in Egypt could be lost for a very long time. So I know I've gone on too long, but oh, now I'll no, take it. Questions. So I'm going to pass around a mic to people that have questions. Um, I ask that you hold your applause between questions. Um, just maybe we can all thank Larry Diamond at the end. And then um, if you have to leave at any time during during the question and answer session, just try to be quiet around the outside. So um, does anyone have a first question? OK, uh, Maya was first. So if you can pass this to Maya. Um, so, Professor Diamond, I had um, maybe a specific example that I think speaks to a broader theoretical approach that I was curious about, uh, your opinion, and it goes to what you were saying earlier about elections now in many Middle Eastern states. So about a decade ago, Israel pulled out of Gaza, and then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and the Bush administration advocated for democratic elections in the Gaza Strip, and then Hamas came to power. Um, they've proved to be vehemently anti-Israel, anti-American, terrorist organization. And I was wondering, first of all, um, do you think that the United States should push for democratic elections if, it's ag if it goes against our interests and if it, um, and if it turns out that um, an Islamic fundamentalist organization will come to power? And specifically in this situation, what you think um, should have happened or what could have happened if this is unfolded differently? So I think we need to have a sophisticated view of this. Um, but also, we need to recognize that there's more convergence between our interests and our ideals than may seem apparent from that uh, debacle. And I think it was a debacle. It's not for us to say whether these countries are going to move toward greater political participation, <coughs> accountability, popular sovereignty, in other words, some form of democracy. You look at the public opinion surveys from the Arab barometer. You look at the Arab Spring. You look at what's happening in Jordan today, where the monarchy, I predict, is either going to reform within the next year or two or fall. I think the monarchy in Jordan is in a state of deepening crisis. It's even losing its Transjordanian base. It's not just the Palestinian origin population anymore. And um, so I think that there's a strong case to be made for us encouraging democratic movement and change rather than just saying, we cling to the old order because it's helpful. And if we don't get out in front of this, not, you know, mandate, well, you must be a democracy tomorrow, but get out in front of it creatively and try and steer it in a more pluralist, uh, more sincerely democratic direction. Uh, a debacle is more likely to happen, and I'll give you an example. Um, first of all, the elections, of course, were not only in Gaza, they were all over. They were in the West Bank and Gaza throughout the entire Palestinian Authority. And second of all, um, it was not much noticed or debated that Fatah had 
designed and actually tweaked an electoral system to ensure that it would get a majority of the seats in, the, in their, what passes for their parliament, even if they only got a plurality of the vote. So they kind of rigged the electoral system to make sure they got a majority of the seats. What they did not anticipate is that Hamas would win the plurality and therefore in winning the plurality would gain a majority of the seats and political control. Um, and if you'd had just a more, you know, if you'd had the Israeli electoral system of truly proportional representation, Hamas would have gotten, I don't know, 42% of the seats, not 55% of the seats. Um, and I think that's just one example of a number of subsidiary points that could be made. Number one, if you want viable democracy, you need to think long and hard about the design of democratic and electoral institutions and how they fit the society and the particular cleavages and vulnerabilities. Number two, you need to have a constitution with strong constraints on um, uh, executive, arbitrary executive power and protection for individual rights. And number three, you may need to phase these things in, the movement toward democracy, so it doesn't happen all at once. You know, in, in an Arab barometer question a few years ago, they, people were asked if they want gradual or rapid democratic change. And over 70% said they want it to happen gradually. People in Morocco, people in Jordan, people in Kuwait, I think it was the case no longer in Bahrain, could have lived with some kind of phasing in of a, of a plan for democratic empowerment and transition over a period of time to allow time for adjustment in the building of, you know, uh, counter alliances to the Islamists. Um, but when the monarchs just kind of dig in their heels and say basically nothing's going to change, then pressure builds up for a big leap, and a big leap is more risky than an incremental one. Um, so just to switch tacks a little bit, you talked about... Here's another microphone. Sorry, just to switch tacks a little bit, so you talked about political... And, uh, you know, the State Department talks a lot about that, too, the U.S. State Department and in reference to the Arab world specifically as well. But how can people take what the U.S. government or what we are saying seriously if we only discuss political hegemony in certain situations and not others? For example, Vladimir Putin in Russia. I mean, you can't seriously argue that he's not creating barricades to make sure that oh. he stays in power for a long time. So, But that's rarely, if ever, mentioned by anyone of significant importance within the U.S. foreign policy establishment. So if I was a leader in the Arab world, how am I supposed to take anything the United States takes seriously? I think um, there the, the relevant example is not so much Putin, I'll come to that in a minute, but our you know, unquestioning alliance with other Arab authoritarian states um, who, uh, you know, are long strategic partners and serve our interests. And, you know, I wrote something on Bahrain that I think was um, pretty damning of the Obama administration's policy. It's, it's been truly a moral catastrophe. Uh, and um, I think we've lost a large segment of the Shia Bahrain um, who really were friendly to the United States and who were not mere pawns of Iran. Uh, one of them was a former uh, summer fellow here at our Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law and has now been sentenced to uh, life in prison for peaceful political protest. Uh, and he's handicapped, uh, he has only, you know, good use of one leg and was horribly, degradingly tortured in prison. <clears throat> I can give you a 20-page single-space statement of his documenting that. And so, 
You know, when the U.S. is associated without questioning what's happening, this sort of, or, or pushing very hard, this sort of thing, yes, it makes people cynical. And then, then it makes the leaders of the region say, well, <clears throat> as long as we s keep cooperating in intelligence and keep, you know, uh, funneling the oil to them, we've got them literally over a barrel and we can do what we want. And I think we need to push harder. We need their strategic cooperation. We need the Fifth Fleet to be based in Bahrain. But you know something? Bahrain needs it and Saudi Arabia needs it actually more than we do. If we pull out of Bahrain, they're much more in danger than we are. So um, uh, I think we need to use our leverage more and I strongly agree with the thrust of your comment. We can't always be perfectly consistent, but we can be less hypocritical and less brazenly so than we've been. In the case of Russia, it's sad. It's, it's kind of, and for me, it's a very personal tragedy because our, my friend, our collective friend for many people on campus, my colleague, Mike McFall, senior fellow here at Hoover, professor at Stanford, is the U.S. ambassador there. And I think he tried very hard um, after arriving there, uh, beginning of last year, to really embrace the Russian opposition, Russian civil society, to project in many ways um, our values and our, our support for um, democratic uh, principles and organizations in, um, uh, in Russia. And Putin reacted with, um, I, I think, uh, uh, almost hatred. And certainly, I would say, something pretty close to clinical paranoia. I, I think he's not a well individual. I think he's an increasingly mentally unstable person. And, um, a dangerous individual and a ruthless individual, and this is the man who's now implanted himself uh, as, in a way, the new czar. I mean, it's not totalitarianism. There's much more space for people to live their own lives and have a little gesture of opposition now and then. But Russia has become a very ugly, very hard, very vicious, and just unimaginably corrupt authoritarian regime. And we still cling to the hope, the Obama administration, that you know, if we don't push too hard, if we don't rip the cover off too much, maybe they'll cooperate on Syria, maybe we'll get cooperation on this. And um, I agree with the thrust of your question. I think we should, uh, we should be much more openly critical of what's been happening. So uh, just going back to this idea of sort of how rapidly we can have democracy come up in the Middle East, I think another issue that at least I've seen and you know, maybe I don't have the full perspective on this is that a lot of the ideas we associate with democracy, individual rights, human rights, those sort of things, they're in some societies, not all, they're fundamentally at odds in public opinion. I think I read a survey that said in Egypt something along the lines of 84% of people approved of the death penalty for apostates, those who convert away from Islam who are born as Muslims. Now, maybe those polls are skewed, but the question is, are there, if you have democracy, and we, we've we seen groups like the Muslim Brotherhood come to power, whether or not you know there was a palpable liberal opposition that could have gotten in, is that something that you know we can work on, the hearts and minds sort of strategy to get people to adopt more quote unquote Western ideas or is that something that only comes, you know, through slow and gradual change when these societies themselves change? It's something that can't be imposed or perhaps will never be. Is that something that, that bothers you? Yeah, of course. I, I think about it a lot. Um, let me say a couple things. I, I haven't seen that survey item, but I have seen others, including very recent ones, that suggest that the median voter in Egypt today wants secular democracy, um, or at most democracy where there's a very modest role for religion. Um, I think that if there's a free and fair election next time, 
the Muslim Brotherhood, for Parliament, say, the Muslim Brotherhood will do worse than it did in the last parliamentary elections. And um, it, it would be naive to say that once you open up, you know, a deeply uh, authoritarian country with lots of suppressed cleavages, anxieties, resentments, you know, this bubbling cauldron, that you're not risking effusions of illiberal and even you know, ethnocentric, racist sentiment or so on. You're probably familiar with the work by Snyder and Mansfield that ba who basically say, I can give you the references, be careful, you know, you start to democratize and you could get Yugoslavia or Rwanda. I think the answer there is, well then, you, you don't say, uh, let's cling to authoritarianism, it's just too risky. You think again about the institutional designs that can contain that, the rules, the laws, the constitutions, the institutions. How do you can go to work on the culture over a long period of time through engagement to whittle that down? Um, and you know, what, are, what is the pace and strategy for the introduction of democratic institutions? And, and you've just got to have a longer term perspective. Um, I think the only way for many of these countries to democracy is through democracy. Authoritarianism, it, you know, it's not going to be Taiwan or Korea or Singapore, I think, is coming, where you had very successful authoritarianism, you know, gradually giving rise to at least somewhat liberal values and certainly affirmation of the market, rapid economic development, and gradually democratization, soft landing to liberal democracy. It ain't gonna happen like that in the Arab world, in my opinion, or in, um, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. I think that authoritarianism is associated with such profound corruption, even in the rich Gulf states. Look how the you know, average person in Bahrain lives, the ordinary, People, uh, you know, it's, you know, I, I visited homes uh, in the midst of this kind of, you know, uh, obscene royal wealth, palaces all over the place in a tiny, tiny largely arid country. Uh, I mean, you know, you're not going to get a soft landing there. And so what you have to ensure is that they don't close down democracy. They don't use it to construct hegemony. The great thing about democracy that gives me hope for Tunisia and hope for Egypt, if Egypt can turn the corner away from the hegemony that the Muslim Brotherhood is clearly trying to correct, and if the United States will finally stand up and say, you know, this is wrong and we're critical of it, is the capacity for self-correction through subsequent elections, which is why Jeregian made the point that he made. Okay. Um. I think we're going to wrap it up now. But he, Do uh, you have time to take his question because he was raising his okay. hand? Okay. Yeah, we can take one more question. That's fine if everybody's okay with sitting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm going to shift the focus to the <clears throat> other side of the world, to Venezuela. Yeah. And a lot has happened over the past two months with Hugo Chavez yeah. <laughs> claiming that he is going to die soon because of cancer. So could you talk a little bit more about what direction is Venezuela headed into? say in the short term? So I think there is no question that Hugo Chavez is dying of cancer, probably has stage four cancer and probably has only a few months or weeks to live. It's conceivable he's not even any longer alive. Um, and it is conceivable to me that when he dies in the deep recesses of some Cuban hospital, they will deny it and lie about it for a long time while the surviving elite of his party and regime figures out how to rescue their situation. Um, but there's massive evidence just from looking at Chavez. He's lost all his hair. He's clearly been under chemotherapy. He's all puffed up. Uh, he's not the same person. Uh, that's, that's obvious. There, um, it, it, I, I think people I know and respect expect there to be some kind of transition in Venezuela within a matter of months, if not sooner. He has appointed uh, a successor, his, uh, appointed a vice president who's meant to succeed him, a man who's alternately been described as in some ways even more of an ideological hardliner 
uh, and others see as, you know, potentially having a pragmatic and negotiating streak, but I think he's not going to be any better. The head of the National Assembly is a rival of his, more of an old-time clientelistic pop, uh, politician, but I don't think he'll um, outmaneuver this vice president, who I believe is named Maduro. Um, there will have to be, if they have even a, 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 a faint respect for the democratic constitutional order, an election pretty soon after uh, uh, Chavez is declared to have died, which is one of the reasons why I think they're going to delay the announcement of his death, again, while they try and ramp up and figure it out. Um, I would say Capriles, who I believe the opposition candidate, Enrique Capriles, uh, in the October 2012 presidential election, I think Capriles would have won a free and fair election, and I don't have time to detail all the massive institutional advantages that favored Chavez, but I think you're familiar with them, that in uh, a truly free, fair election with relatively equal access to the media, no climate of fear and intimidation, the results probably would have been reversed. Capriles would have won about 55% and Chavez would have won about 45%. That's just a guess. That is to say, you seem to know something about Venezuela. There's a real base of support for uh, Chavez. You have to recognize that. Uh, but the support has been ebbing away. The society is fed up and you know, wants to move on. So without Chavez's charisma, I think his successor, whoever he is in the presidential election, will have to rig more badly and brazenly in order to win. Uh, that allows the possibility that they'll simply be defeated in an election. It allows the possibility that they'll declare results that can be shown to be fraudulent and then potentially a color revolution. Um, there's also the possibility, I think Capriles is a pragmatic individual, that he'll work out a deal with these guys and say, look, let the election go forward. We're not going to prosecute. No victors, no vanquish. What's happened in a lot of transitions. But I'd say um, Venezuela is in for a very historic, consequential, uh, critical uh, few months ahead. <clears throat> All right, so if anybody has any extra questions, um, feel free to ask them like after this talk with Larry Damon. I just wanted to wrap it up because we're technically supposed to finish at one. Actually, I don't know if you have to leave. But um, thanks for all, all for coming. And if you're interested in writing for the review or contributing to our blog or anything, shoot me an email at lisaw 2 at. Also, you can monitor our Facebook and Twitter page for future events like this. So thank you.